All right, so now for something uh, mostly completely different. Uh, we've heard various references to pulsar timing throughout the, throughout the week. Um, but I'm going to talk just a little bit about what pulsar timing is, briefly what we're trying to do with gravitational waves, um, and then go through some challenges that we have, some questions that I want to pose to, to, uh, to the audience in general. Um, so first of all, just the basic of most basic preliminaries here. Um, so first of all, pulsars are just highly magnetized rotating neutron stars, um, in case you didn't know. Um, and we use a specific kind of pulsars for the gravitational wave detection. So we use these millisecond pulsars. So what this is, this is called a PP diagram. So this is the log of the period derivative, and this is the period, so it's the spin period, and then how fast this, or how the rate at which the pulsar is slowing down. And so there's a huge population of pulsars up here that have periods on the order of a second. Um, these are sort of young, unstable pulsars that aren't very good for timing. Um, and then down here we have the millisecond pulsars, and if you can see here, there's about at least five orders of magnitude difference in the spin period derivative. So these are incredibly stable, or short periods, um, and these are the ones that we use for timing for the gravitational wave detection. And just the way you can think about timing, at least in a sort of a cartoon version, which this is a PDF, so I don't have the movie, but you can think of this pulsar spinning around kind of like a lighthouse, and then when the beam comes within your line of sight, you measure that beam with some radio telescope, and you're basically just trying to measure when that pulse arrived at Earth. Um, and then from there, you create the residuals, which is just this measured time of arrival, minus some model that has basically everything that you can think of between the pulsar and the Earth. Um, so this has models for the pulsar, so if the pulsar is in a binary, you have to account for all the binary parameters. Um, you have to account for the interstellar medium between us and the pulsar. Um, lots of other things. Many, many parameters go into here, and this is one of the main, you know, the main features that we're using when we're, we're trying to detect gravitational waves. Um, and I have a couple other plots of this, but this is just one idea of what our data looks like. Um, so it is pretty gappy. There's gaps in the data. You can tell it's extremely uh, heteroscedastic, so the, the error bars here can vary by more than an order of magnitude uh, in a given data set. Uh, so it's very, very messy. Um, and this is actually an averaged version. The real data is even worse than this. Uh, the real data, we have many, many, many measurements basically taken simultaneously. This is just average to make it look a bit nicer. <clears throat> okay, so that was the pulsar timing. So in terms of gravitational waves, um, there are other kind of sources you may be able to detect cosmic strings, various crazy things like this. Um, but our main source are supermassive black hole binaries. Um, and so these are actually, you know, billion solar mass black holes, so these are from galaxies colliding, essentially. And the way you can think about this is sort of building up gravitational waves in this way. And so we have these hierarchical models of the universe where you start off with you know, small structures, they merge, form bigger structures, and you just get this merger tree as they build up. And that's how you get the large-scale structures we have today. Uh, you can't read the labels on these, but these are basically showing various galaxy characteristics related to the black hole mass. So we have galaxies merging, we have characteristics of these galaxies like the, the mass and the velocity dispersion of the stars within the galaxy, and those things correlate with the black hole mass. Um, and so you sort of combine these observed effects from the galaxies with models of merger trees of how black holes should actually merge, and you can get out predictions of the gravitational wave strain that these black holes would emit. And so we're not looking for single events for the most part. Um, so LIGO is looking for these coalescences. Uh, we're more looking for this background. So this is basically the history of all the mergers that have happened in the universe, essentially. And this will cr kind of create this noise that has a specific, um, a specific spectrum and a specific correlation it should have amongst pulsars. Um, and just the easiest version of this, we use other versions, but the easiest way of thinking of this is it's just some power law at low frequencies. Of course, this doesn't go all the way down to zero frequency. Um, but the range where PTAs are up here around nanohertz, um, we're probably right on the edge of, of where this spectrum you know, may deviate from a power law. Yep. Why is the background more... Probably because 
for single events, you'd have to have like really massive black holes merging, which are, which are more rare than smaller mass black holes, or would they have to be really close? Um, or, you know, maybe 100 years, 50 years in the future, we'll have really good timing and we won't have to have big nearby mergers. But it's just because, you know, there aren't that many galaxy mergers and you have to get lucky and have a, a really heavy one, really massive one. There's no data out of seven There's no what? There's no data out of seven Oh no, single sources are, are pretty easy for, for pulsars. So I've worked on this a lot because you're way, way out in the end spiral. So there's no chirp, it's just pretty much just a sinusoid. Um, there is a complication with the fact that the Earth and the pulsar are pretty far apart and you'll see different parts of the waveform. Um, it's actually a fun data analysis problem if anyone cares how to deal with that, but it's, it's pretty easy none after you get past that part. <clears throat> okay, so I labeled my talk, Physical, Statistical, and Computational Challenges. Um, I just want to go over, so all of these are not challenges for people in the room, but these are sort of the main things that we're facing right now. Um, so the first one is the most basic. Do we understand the noise in our data? And the answer to that is no. Um, we have various models for how to model things that are loosely based on physics, uh, but for the most part, um, we sort of have lots of, of, of models that we come up with just to try to, to model the noise in some way. Um, so this is really important for detection. This is really important for when we think we might make a detection. Are we confident in the gravitational wave, wave background signal model? Um, so like I said, we model this as a power law. We, we know for certain that it's not a power law all the way down to really low frequencies, but we're not quite sure where that cuts off. Um, because you don't just have two isolated black holes merging, you have two galaxies merging. So there's lots of stars and gas. And the stars and the gas actually drive the, the black holes to the part where gravitational wave uh, radiation will take over. Um, but the question, we don't know exactly when that turns off and gravitational waves will take over. Um, so we've started doing things allowing the gravitational wave model a bit more flexibility. So we allow for turnovers in the spectrum basically wherever the data uh, tells us they should be. Um, so that's just one thing. We're not quite confident in the, the model, so we use flexible models just to let the data uh, tell us what's, what's most likely. So in terms of statistical things, um, and I'll show in a second, how do we model several different kinds of noise processes simultaneously um, when they all look almost exactly the same? Uh, we think we have a decent handle on, on how to do this. Um, because luckily there's, there's certain effects that correlate with other things, so you usually can, can separate them out. Um, so are the data really Gaussian? This is one of the, the problems that I'm posing, but I think at least ways of dealing with this are getting solved, and Tack's gonna talk about that after this. Uh, but there's always this Gaussian assumption, and for the longest time we've completely relied on this assumption. Um, and as we get newer data, it's starting to look more and more like this, this may not be the case. Um, so how do we assess detection significance? Um, so we have various ways of trying to detect the stochastic background. We can get some number out, like a base factor or a signal to noise ratio, but then how do you assess that? How do you do something like time slides or something like that that LIGO does? Um, so here's just a very generic question. How do we sample large parameter spaces? I'll show you in a second. Our parameter spaces can get up to tens of thousands of parameters. Uh, and then the computational challenge, um, which there's been a lot of progress on this in the last five years, uh, but basically how do we do all of this with ever increasing data set volume, or data volume and more pulsars, which means more parameters. Um, so the computational problem is, is a bit hard. Okay, so here is our, our model sort of in pictures. Um, so for the most part, the way we do things is we model everything as a Gaussian process even if they're not actually the same processes. Um, so you can think of the, the timing residuals here. So this is the TOA minus some model that we have for the pulsar. Um, so we, of course, have radiometer noise. This is just noise from the telescope um, because we don't have noiseless telescopes. Uh, so we have timing model errors. These are just things because we've subtracted off this timing model. We didn't do that perfectly. There's a little bit, uh, a little bit left. We have this special thing called jitter noise. There's a technical name for this. We just call it ECOR. Um, this is basically 
an artifact of the way that we take data, um, which I won't really get into it, but this acts like a very short time scale correlated noise process. So it's correlated over you know, milliseconds, but not over, not over days. Uh, we have dispersion measure variations because this is traveling through the interstellar medium. Uh, the pulsars are moving through the sky. The interstellar medium is not uniform, so we have these dispersion measure variations that are time dependent. We have to model that. Uh, we have timing noise. Uh, the pulsars are not perfectly stable. They usually have low frequency drifts, uh, so we have to take that into account as well. And then lastly, we have gravitational waves. This could be from single sources uh, or most likely a, a background, which looks like this timing noise. All right, so that's one pulsar, uh, but we have a PTA, pulsar timing array. So we take all these different models. The gravitational waves we treat as the correlated Gaussian process. Um, so this is correlated in time across multiple pulsars, but it's also correlated uh, spatially. So it's correlated with the, the pulsar locations in the sky. And so sort of the time correlations, like I said, we expect it to be some sort of power law, maybe with a turnover, depending on the, the physics that go into the model. Uh, the spatial correlation is this, this signal here. So this is the correlation. This is the angular separation of pulsars in the sky. And so this is this famous thing. If you ever read any pulsar timing gravitational wave stuff, this is the Hellings and Downs curve. Um, so these are just the correlations you would expect to have between two pulsars at different angular separations when you have a stochastic uh, background. And so this really is the real smoking gun because you can have things that give you, you know, red red type spectra, but gravitational waves are the only thing that are going to give you this kind of correlation uh, spatially. Here? Um, no, they're, they're pretty, they're fairly different. Uh, because this radiometer noise and this jitter. Um, no, no, what I'm saying is uh, radiometer noise for all the pulsars. Is it similar? Uh, yeah, yeah, no. That's Yeah, because, it, well, I mean, there's the radiometer noise, which is just how well the telescope can measure. But this also depends on the, the signal to noise of the pulsar itself, which is very different. So this can be orders of magnitude different. Yeah, so at least the radiometer noise, the jitter noise, the timing model errors, those all depend on the signal to noise of the pulsar as well. So lower signal to noise have more errors or higher errors than those things. Okay, so this is just sort of a visual guide, and I apologize, these are all in different formats. I kind of just grab plots from different places. Um, but this is just a visual guide that we have lots of red looking processes in the data. Um, so one is just this intrinsic red noise that I was talking about. Um, so you see there's this very large low frequency correlated structure. We also have the DM variations. This also has this red structure. The gravitational waves themselves are just a red noise process. And we also have these solar system ephemeris errors. Uh, because to do pulsar timing, this is actually extremely sensitive to where the planets are. Um, because we have to do time corrections from where we've measured the pulse on Earth to the solar system barycenter, which we use as our reference frame. And so the solar system barycenter moves around because the planets are, are tugging on it. Um, so this also looks like a red process if you look at the sort of differences in different kinds of, of models for this. Uh, but the good thing is we can separate these things out for the most part. So red noise is achromatic. It's, it's just correlated in time. It's not really coupled to anything else. The DM variations have this one over radio frequency squared dependence. So as long as you have you know, observations at two fairly largely separated radio frequencies, you can separate this out from red noise. The stochastic background does have the same time correlation as this red noise, but it has this spatial correlation. So this alpha AB is just indicating that there's a spatial correlation here that you don't expect with red noise. Solar system ephemeris is a bit more tricky because it, it still has this red signal it has a spatial correlation, but it's a different spatial correlation than the background. So this one is, is pretty hard to do because it's, it's easy to see these, the time correlations, but it's harder to see the spatial. And so if you have other errors that have different spatial correlations, that's where things get 
even, even more tricky. So we're really trying to mitigate this, this error right here. Okay, um, I'll just briefly mention this, nasty equations, but this just goes into two ways that we can do things. We currently use both of these in different ways. Um, so these are just two ways of thinking about Gaussian processes. Um, so we can call this the sort of basis picture or hierarchical model, um, where you model all these signals uh, with some basis function here, which we call the phi's, and they have some weights on them. Um, and then the weights have a Gaussian prior. So this is just a normal Gaussian process. Uh, doing this is fairly nice because it's computationally cheap. There are no matrix inversions. This is a diagonal matrix, so it's easy to invert. And this is a fairly small matrix, so it's not bad. Um, so this is cheap, but when we do this for pulsar applications, there are about 10,000 or so parameters that go into this. Uh, what you can do is marginalize over these weights, so you can integrate them out. And then you get this, which you can call a kernel picture. You still have the nice diagonal white noise piece, but now you have some, some kernel matrix here, which is dense. Uh, so you have to do matrix inversions. There are various tricks you can do to speed this up, but this is still much slower. That should say expensive, not cheap. So for a full PTA, stuff like this is around a second, one second per likelihood call. Um, could be more. And so when you're doing MCMCs, you know, a second to two seconds is, is, is fairly high for, for one call. Um, but there's trade-offs to both of these. This is easy. This is nice because you can do things like Gaussian mixture models, and it's, it's uh, separable, so you can do a lot more things with this, but you have to deal with these parameters. Uh, this is less flexible, but you don't have to deal with as many parameters, but it's, it's slower. All right, so uh, one application of using that hierarchical likelihood um, is something that Tack and I have worked on. Tack mostly came up with the method, and uh, I implemented this on some real data in the last couple, the last week. Um, so Tack's mostly going to talk about this, but this is a way of trying to model outliers, and it uses sort of Gaussian and student T or T distribution uh, mixture model. And this is just an example. This is real data. Um, this is one of our messier pulsars. So you have some data. You see all this junk going on here. You try to use this to make inferences. These things are going to these things are going to mess you up. Um, but when you use this outlier model, there's a lot more details I can go into this. But when you use this, you can sort of pick out the outliers. And so this is just some indicator variables that we're searching over, and these will tell you that you know these are outliers. So it's picked up the outliers pretty well. Um, there's still more work to do on this, but it seems really promising. And like I said, Tack's going to go over the you know, methods for this in the next talk. <clears throat> All right, so here's one of the questions that I wanted to go over. How do you assess the significance of a detection? And just quickly, the models that we're comparing here, so this is sort of the cross power spectrum. So this is how you can look at the spatial correlation. So A and B here are pulsars A and pulsar B. And so model one has this, this correlation coefficient times some power spectrum. Model two has no correlations between different pulsars, but the same power spectrum. So those are the two things we want to compare. We basically want to be able to compare the spatial correlations and have a way of, of somewhat canceling out the, the power spectrum. Um, so that way we can just say that we're looking for something that has the spatial correlations, even though other things can have this red power spectrum as well. And so the way that we currently do this is a play on the way that LIGO does time slides. We can't do time slides because this, this signal is it's not localized in time. It's across the entire data set. Uh, but we can do these things called sky scrambles. So since we're looking for spatial correlations, um, we basically can just give the algorithm fake sky locations. We can just draw some fake sky locations for the pulsars, rerun the whole analysis, putting those sky locations into the correlations. And in that case, you're keeping the same temporal correlations. You're keeping the same power spectrum, but you're just breaking the spatial correlations. And so you do this for many, many runs, and you can get some distribution of your statistic, which in this case was a Bayes factor. Uh, you get some distribution of your statistic for the null hypothesis. So this is also a way of trying to mitigate any errors we might have in the noise model, um, because you're not using any different realizations of data. You're just using the actual noise model you have, and you're just breaking the spatial correlations. Uh, you can do a similar thing. Um, you can add certain phases. So what this is saying here is this is just a way of writing this 
this correlation matrix. So these are Fourier series representation of a covariance matrix. Um, you can also just add phases, and that will break the, the correlations as well. And these two things basically do about the same thing. Um, we can get into this a bit more later because I'm almost out of time. And here's one completely generic question that actually I think applies to some of the stuff we were talking about earlier with machine learning as well, which is, in this case, it's, it's about frequency statistics, but it's if you have some statistic that depends on the data and some set of parameters, um, how do you deal with this? Normally, you just have some likelihood for these parameters. You pick the maximum likelihood value. You compute your statistic. And then you go on from there and, and do whatever kind of criteria you're going to do for detection. <laughs> um, but what if these parameters are you know, not very well measured and they're also correlated with the, the signal that you're looking for? So for instance, the red noise that I was talking about, the parameters that go into that red noise are going to be correlated with the gravitational wave background. So you really don't want to just pick the maximum likelihood values because then you might just be in some weird area of parameter space that you know, you're not getting that full correlation. You're not taking that into account. Um, so one possible way that I was thinking of doing this is if you have the posteriors for these nuisance parameters, you can just draw from those nuisance parameters, compute the statistic for each of them, and then you get a distribution of your statistic. And then from that, you can create some sort of meta statistic, right? You have this distribution. You could just take the mean. You could take the mean over the variance, some, some number like that. At least that's some way of accounting for the uncertainty in the the nuisance parameters and the correlation that you might have with the signal that you're looking for. Um, so this is something I really don't know. I've looked in some of the literature. It seems like this is somewhat unknown how to how to deal with this. Um, and just for the, I'll just leave these up here. These are some of the main questions. One, if anyone wants to talk about sampling later, you know, are there things better than these methods? Um, yeah, and and how do you deal with these uh, frequency statistics when you have lots of nuisance parameters? Uh, the previous slide, please. This one? No, the, or, yeah, the, yeah, this one. So, uh, I mean, that's one way of doing it, I mean, but the MLE that comes with its own sampling distribution, so you could have done sampling. So, uh, when you compute the MLE, you can also compute the Fisher matrix. So, and the distribution of the MLE is as the distribution with that and the Fisher matrix, you can sample from the Emily distribution and compute the, whatever you were doing with the posterior, you could have done that. Mm -hmm. But the, the Fisher matrix is only going to be this Gaussian approximation around the maximum. If you have big curving correlations, that's not going to account for that. No, I mean, if you can compute the MLE, you can compute the Fisher inversion matrix because that comes as a byproduct of that. Yeah. Because you have a likelihood, otherwise you cannot get a MLE. So using that likelihood, you can get a Fisher information. Mm -hmm. And that gives you the distribution of the MLE, which, co which is called the sampling distribution. And you can sample from that distribution, assuming Gaussian. Okay. Because that, that because so it's, it's the same thing, but instead of using, oops, instead of using the posterior, you're using the, the Fisher. Yeah. Uh, it will be possibly giving you almost similar results. Uh, uh, if we had a frequentist, I think that would, would have been the solution. But I, mean, I would recommend this, what you are doing, but that's another alternative. Yeah. I'm, I'm not too tied to whether or not it's completely frequentist or not. But the, the reason that I'm interested in this is because I didn't say, but the, the full gravitational wave runs for Bayesian stuff takes a couple weeks to run, whereas a frequentist type statistic will take like a minute, maybe. In that case, you might try that Fisher information. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, but we don't, I mean, we're maximizing the likelihood essentially by doing the Bayesian thing and then just taking the, the maximum. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, I've seen those before, yeah. Uh, maybe one way is to use some profile likelihood, because since you got maximum likelihood, I assume that you have some likelihood function of mm -hmm. theta. So if you use profile likelihood, then theta becomes a function of d, and in that case, we can use that profile likelihood as your 
likelihood within your Bayesian uh, machinery. Maybe I, just I remember one I looked into that and I convinced myself that that wouldn't work, but I, I don't remember. I don't remember why. Mm -hmm. Oh, so I mean, this is is fairly rough, and like I said, TAC will go into it more. But we sort of have a, a, a indicator variable zero one, whether or not it's an outlier, and this is just basically whether or not the the mean of that is bigger than 0.95. So I mean, this is just just is just visual. I mean, really, you're you're using all of the data to to do your inference. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is just visual to show that it, it picks that picks that stuff up. 